Okay. Hello there, this is Kendo Nagasaki, Peter Thornley, the man behind the mask, and I am watching Cheap Shot Entertainment this afternoon and, and this morning and tonight. Hope you all join me. Bye! Promotional consideration paid for by the following. <laughs> This is awesome! Hello and welcome wrestling fans. It's that time again. It's WrestleMania season and 20 years ago today, WrestleMania 20 came to you from the home of WWE, WWF, Madison Square Garden in New York City, New York. If you haven't done so already, please do click subscribe and like the video <coughs> so should you do so that would be very grateful so this is sheep shot entertainment you are the sheep shot nation and we're going to do a review podcast of wrestlemania 20 um one of the uh, it's around about the halfway point of a really good set of WrestleManias. Um, and uh, yeah, they go all out for this one. As you can see, the tagline is where it all begins again. And that is because Shane McMahon had his son um, around the time of WrestleMania. So it was a big thing, you know, 20 years since the inaugural uh, WrestleMania. We kick off the show with the Harlem Boys Choir singing America the Beautiful, as they usually do on uh, a WrestleMania. They always sing the national anthem of said country, uh, although it hasn't been outside of America for a very long time, I believe. Um, I could be wrong with that, but I'm pretty sure it's just gone traveling around several states. Don't even think it's gone all 50. Um, so, yeah, it's 20th edition of WrestleMania. It does feature both SmackDown and Raw superstars. It had an attendance, a measly attendance of 18,500 fans. And considering that they get in excess of 70, 80,000 every year now, that just that figure just seems really, really low. It wasn't for the time, of course. Um, the date, March 14th, um, are in um, two, uh, 2004. Uh, a pretty infamous year, actually. Uh, the Rock returns, uh, Brock Lesnar, Goldberg both leave. Um, yeah, pretty infamous. And uh, it was a... Staggering five hour runtime. First time, uh, yeah, <laughs> first time ever really that they've gone over four hours. Uh, theme songs are Step Up by Drowning Paul and Touche by God Smack. And uh, the game appears, the arena, sorry, appears in the games WWE 2K14, WWE WrestleMania 21, uh, WWE SmackDown vs. Raw. And Day of Reckoning. And uh, without further ado, we're going to go on to the first match, which featured John Cena and The Big Show. And the first match at WrestleMania 20 featured John Cena and The Big Show. Big Show defending his United States Championship at WrestleMania. He's been on a bit of a tear. Uh, recent weeks before WrestleMania, John Cena and The Big Show have been going back and forth, uh, and uh, it is a David versus Goliath story. Of course, John Cena was very young at this point in time and had just come up from NXT and was dazzling along with Batista and uh, Brock Lesnar. The match itself, it was very good. 
I really enjoyed this one. I do like a bit of Thugonomics John Cena. And uh, obviously the big show was moving around a little easier at this point in time as well. And he was very impressive uh, in his younger days because he could still move around uh, like a big guy, but he could move around also like a cruiserweight as well. And uh, he's sort of middling at this point in time, sort of gaining a little bit of weight. Um, but he was absolutely devastating in his offense. Of course, John Cena uh, would need to bring all of his street thugonomics to this match because um, of the size difference. But it's no trouble for the thugonomics John Cena because he carries brass knucks and a chain. And it was these that would ultimately lead to his victory over the big show uh, with two FUs, of course named after the F5 when he was having his feud with Brock Lesnar and the brass knuckles as uh, the referee was distracted with the chain. So you have a new United States champion in John Cena and his first gold on the main roster. Of course, he would go on to have a tremendous championship winning streak. And uh, yes, this is the start of that. I'm going to give this one three cheap shots out of five. Very, very entertaining match. And it really showcased what both guys could do and pass the torch, so to speak, to the new generation of 2004. We head to the back now with Coach wandering around backstage and his goes into Eric Bischoff's office. And he wants to know where the Undertaker is. And Eric Bischoff sends him on a wild goose chase. He is no Leslie Nielsen. And this is not 1994 SummerSlam. So who knows where the Undertaker is. Another promo now from Randy Orton, the legend killer. He's flanked by Batista and Ric Flair. Of course, we have a big six-man tag match lined up for WrestleMania 20. Uh, actually, no, it's not a six-man tag. It's a three-on-two handicap match between Evolution, Batista, Ric Flair, and Randy Orton, and the Rock and Suck connection, of course, being The Rock and Mick Foley. Should be noted, this promo is brilliant. Multiple camera angles, obviously the... Uh, um, Members of Evolution looking suited and booted, looking good, looking dominant, even in a promo, just looking badass. And they shoot the promo exactly where Randy Orton hunted Mick Foley down the stairs. It's good to bring up the past sometimes, especially when it's in wrestling. This promo, if I could give it a cheap shot rating, I would absolutely give it a six because I want to be Dave Meltzer and get paid for doing this. We move on to the next match, which is the World Tag Team Championship match, Fatal 4-Way. Raw Tag Team Championship action now as the World Tag Team Championships are on the line in a Fatal 4-Way match. It is Booker T. And Rob Van Dam defending their championships against the Dudley Boys, Devon and Bubba Ray, La Resistance, Rene Dupree and Rob Conway and Garrison Cade and Mark Jindrak, the youngest team in this match. There was a lot to keep up with here, um, but needless to say, there was lots of action for all four teams with La Resistance being uh, the main heels of this match. Sadly, Jindrak and Garrison Cade seemed like an afterthought in this match because they didn't really get a lot of offense in. And they're both really big, imposing guys. Of course, Garrison Cade no longer with us, um, taken too young by the same means as a lot of professional wrestlers, um, which is really sad. And, um, you know, been brought to attention um, recently 
in uh, yeah in the world. So um, yeah, this match uh, it would be Booker T and Rob Van Dam retaining after a very hard-fought match. Dudley Boys doing all their stuff, almost bringing in the tables, not quite. And Booker T, Rob Van Dam retain with the scissor kick and the five-star frog splash on Conway for the victory. La Resistance eating the pin here. Um, and for a match with four teams, a lot to keep up on. I really enjoyed this one. I really enjoyed tag team wrestling anyway. And when you took four decent teams together and they can put a match on like this, I really appreciate it. I'm going to give this one three cheap shots out of five. Straight down the middle on the first two matches of WrestleMania 20. But a good way to get the crowd hyped for what's coming later on. We move on to the next match. But before we go into the next match, we're following Jonathan Coachman again in his pursuit of The Undertaker. Like I say, he is no Leslie Nielsen, but you can call him Shirley, as I believe he does actually like that. Now, he, on his pursuit of The Undertaker, finds Mean Gene and Bobby Heenan uh, locked in a cupboard together, uh, it's conspicuously um, with lipstick on their collars. Flanked by Mae Young and Fabulous Moolah in uh, what can only be described as some sort of uh, frolicking of summer something. And uh, we'll move away from that now and go on to the next match as Christian and Chris Jericho start a rivalry for the ages. Former best friends, now bitter enemies, fighting over the girl, so to speak, in Trish Stratus. Uh, Jericho believes that he is fighting for her honour. However, that doesn't quite happen in this match because he, there's a big twist at the end. So to finish this match off, after lots of toing and froing, trying to get the best of one another through grapple holds and wrestling moves, uh, Chris Jericho succumbs to Christian um, as Christian is uh, nursing his uh, eyes. Uh, he gets um, poked in the eyes. Um, he is down in the corner. Trish tries to help, uh, but um he uh gets a sorry it's a back elbow uh after christian manhandles trish so a back elbow from trish to chris jericho and he's caught off guard as he's trying to uh save trish from christian he is down in the corner nursing his wounds and uh, uh christian capitalizes and uh gets the pin and uh eats the uh unprettier and uh, yeah, like I say, gets the pin. And this is a huge turn of event because one of the greatest match, uh, match endings of all time and the biggest heel turn that I can think of is Trish Stratus slapping Chris Jericho um, to uh, give Christian the victory here in this one. Um, I really enjoyed this match, including the interference that seemed like it was going to be another Miss Elizabeth moment. But it wasn't. Nice turn of events. I'm going to give this one a four cheap shots out of five. Like I say, really good match and a twist for the ages here at WrestleMania. 20. We move into the back again with The Rock cutting a promo, asking everybody if they're ready for WrestleMania and telling Lillian that the People's Buffet is closed. <laughs> great, great line. 
And as Mick Foley looks on um, in the uh, uh, as a as a side character for this promo, just let the Rock do his thing. He's really good. He's still really good. Back now, of course. Um, I would say probably full time. He's on the board, isn't he? So uh, yeah, really cool, really cool promo. And that leads us onto the three on two handicap match. After that rousing speech by The Rock, how could you not be hyped for the next match? The three-on-two handicap match featuring Evolution versus The Rock and Sock Connection. Evolution consisting of Randy Orton, Ric Flair and Batista. And The Rock and Sock Connection, the classic The Rock and Mick Foley, who is uh, dressed as kind of like a, a Cactus Jack in this case this was definitely one that had a lot of entertainment a lot of things going for it rick flair doing his standard bump off the top um doing his uh rick flair walk thing and the rock taking the mickey out of him trying to do the rock the people's elbow rock bouncing up and taking him out um it would unfortunately come down to a numbers game however I think they chose the right team to win here over the popular t popular choice because Evolution were up and coming. Evolution were there all the time. The Rock and Sock connection has been brought back for this specific moment. And uh, Rick Foley had been having a feud with Randy Orton, Randy Orton being the legend killer at this point in time. And The Rock had come back from Hollywood to help him out. And, uh, yeah, it was a really good, entertaining match. And uh, it would be Evolution who would get the victory with Orton going over on Mick Foley with an RKO after a double arm TDT and a setup for the Mandible Claw. Uh, and another legend is down from Randy Orton. Like I say, really entertaining match. Did everything it needed to do. I'm going to give this one a 3.5 soup shots out of 5 as we move on to the semi main events, the middle of the card, and uh, obviously the main events coming up later on. But yes, really entertaining match, and it was also good to see The Rock back in the ring. Next, we get to see the inductees of the class of 2004 for the WWE Hall of Fame. We've, of course, got Bobby Heenan, Tito Santana, Big John Studd, represented by his son, John Minton Jr., Harley Race, Pete Rose, the first inductee into the celebrity wing, Don Morocco, Greg the Hammer Valentine, the Junkyard Dog, represented by his daughter, LaToya Ritter. Superstar Billy Graham, lifting barbell plates. Sergeant Slaughter, the Sarge, shares a birthday with me. And I've also started using his uh, patented Cobra Clutch in wrestling school as well. And of course, Jesse the Body Ventura, who ain't got time to bleed because he's Jesse the Body Ventura, but incidentally, he does have time to interview Donald Trump later on in the show and also run for office. We all know how that went, didn't we? I'm going to kind of gloss over this one. It's a sign of the times. It's the Playboy evening gown match between Sable and Tory Wilson, and they defeat Stacey Keebler and Miss Jackie in a SmackDown vs. Raw scenario. And both teams start with their gowns off, but there's always one spoil sport, and that was Jackie in this case. They strip her down. They have this little match, uh, if they can call it a match. And, uh, yeah, not great. 0 0.5, soup shots out of 5. We move into the back again as Eddie Guerrero fires up his best mate, Chris Benoit, for his championship match. Benoit says he is absolutely ready. He had to go through 29 other guys to get here. 
and he's not about to chuck it away now. Cruiserweight Championship up next in Cruiserweight action, and it's the Cruiserweight Open. So more than two Cruiserweights in this one. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, more than two Cruiserweights in this one going after the title. As Chavo Guerrero defends against Rey Mysterio, Tajiri, Funaki, Akio, JB Noble, Billy Kidman, Nunzio, Ultimo Dragon, and Shannon Moore. It would be Shannon Moore who would go out first uh, in this one. Next would be uh, Ultimo Dragon. As uh, Nunzio manages to get all the way through to the fourth entrant in this one. Billy Kidman goes out at number six. Funaki goes out at number three. <coughs> followed by Nunzio. Then Jamie Noble. Um, followed by Akio. But he doesn't actually get into the ring. So I'm not accounting him as a an elimination. It would be Tajiri that goes out next. Incidentally, Tajiri threw, uh, spat the green mist. In Akio's eyes, so he never got to enter the match. And then Rey Mysterio <coughs> was the one that he was trying to spit at, and he went through quite a few of the contenders, only to be defeated by Chavo Guerrero after a distraction from Chavo Sr. Decent match. Uh, good to see so many guys in the cruiserweight. Division getting their time to shine on WrestleMania. I say time to shine. There wasn't a lot of time here. Some of them just got rolled up and they were out. Uh, some of them didn't even get in the ring. And it is a bit of a shame that they didn't get a bit more time. Considering we had an evening gown match before it. Um, you know, they could have been given a little bit more time to this. And it was to get the crowd hype because the next match is a bit of a stinker. I'm going to give this one three cheap shots out of five. Uh, really good match. Uh, like I say, the distraction uh, brings it down a peg and the amount of time they got to work. But for what time they did have, it was really, really good. Next up, we have a match that can only be described as terrible as both participants were leaving the WWE and out of contract at the time and of course it was when the internet was getting big in professional wrestling and people liked to read dirt sheets and know what was happening before they spent hundreds of dollars going to a wrestling show where they already knew what was going to happen. Welcome to the modern era of wrestling. It is Goldberg versus Brock Lesnar. This feud has been going on for a couple of months. Uh, Brock Lesnar would cost Goldberg his chance to win the Royal Rumble. Goldberg came in at number 30 at No Way Out. Goldberg would be given a front row ticket to No Way Out to watch Brock Lesnar defend his title against Eddie Guerrero. Goldberg would get involved in that match and ultimately Eddie Guerrero would pick up the championship. So we lead to WrestleMania and there's no one else that could control this match other than Stone Cold Steve Austin and sadly not even he could pick the crowd up for this one. There was a lot of swearing and telling the referee, uh, the participants in this match to basically go and do one. Yeah, I'm not going to swear, but that's pretty much what they said. Special referee, Stone Cold Steve Austin. No effort, no, not even uh, Stone Cold could pick this one up. Um, they put together a match that was boring, and obviously the crowd were on top of them, so they did get uh, et up about that. But that is the spotlight, that is... You know, if you're in the spotlight, you're going to expect to get trolled right while you're doing it. It doesn't always uh, hit the point or um, even make any sense. But, you know, if you're on that kind of stage and, uh, you know, it's very much common knowledge that you're leaving, then 
of course they're going to be uh, mad. But you know, it's up to you. If you want to leave somewhere, that is your choice ultimately, and that's what both of these guys did. However, they didn't go out with a flurry, and and both had the capability to do that uh, with the backgrounds respectively and they didn't they didn't care they were just gone so um i'm going to give this one 0.5 cheap shots out of five the bonus here is that both guys got a stone cold stunner and stone cold drank some beer hooray wwe tag team championship up for grabs next on WrestleMania 20. It is Rikishi and Scotty Too Hotty, also known as Too Cool, defending their championships against the greatest tag team in the world, or the world's greatest tag team in Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin, the APA, Bradshaw and Farouk, the, uh, and the Basham brothers, all former champions, incidentally. Uh, and uh, yeah, again, this one was decent. Um, obviously, Rikishi being the biggest in the match would stay outside for most of it, but have a massive impact towards the end of the match. The Bashams uh, doing all their tag team stuff, obviously, and with them, it's one of those um, like twin magic things. You know, you don't know which one's which because they both look exactly the same. Of course, they were doing the dominatrix thing with Shaniqua at the time. Charlie Haas, Shelton Benjamin, both absolutely brilliant. And under the tutelage of Kurt Angle, were fantastic. Obviously, um, that is not so much anymore. But, uh, yes, they've uh, definitely shown at this point that they can handle themselves. And the APA are just smash mouth brawlers who uh, will just smash you smash you up basically and uh, Bradshaw and one of the big moments in this match Bradshaw delivering that close line from hell out of nowhere just uh, moving out of the way of a move running from one rope to the other and smashing his arm across someone's face will never get old I love the close line from hell absolutely fantastic move but it was Rikishi and Scotty Too Hearty retaining the tag championships in much the same way that the Raw Tag Team Championships were defended, the Raw Championships, as it were, um, with the champions retaining. However, in this case, it would be Rikishi's 400-pound frame dropping on the chest of Doug Basham for the win, whilst the rest of the uh, contingent were outside uh, recovering from various different moves in the shotgun. 3.5 cheap shots out of 5 for this one. I really enjoyed this. I much preferred the SmackDown tag division at this point in time than I did the Raw tag division. But that's again, and I will say this again, that's because I did have access to SmackDown when it was around this time uh, because it was on Sky 1. And we still had Sky at that point, but uh, we didn't. We had the lowest package, no sports or anything like that. But SmackDown was available on a Saturday morning. Brilliant. Um, you know, you, you come you know, have a, a week at college and uh, then sit down on Saturday morning and just sit down for two hours and, and just watch wrestling. And it was bright. It was colourful. It was wonderful, and it obviously had a lot of things going for it. Good match. And before we go into the next match, Jesse the Body Ventura comes out from being inducted into the Hall of Fame and interviews a future Hall of Famer in the celebrity wing and future United States President in Donald J. Trump. And he says, can I count on your money for me to get into office? And Donald Trump says, yes. Obviously, that was a big lie. He's good at that, but that's fake news. Anyway, <laughs> move on to the Women's Championship match next. And it is a stipulation match in hair versus hair. Basically, 
Molly Holly has said if she doesn't beat Victoria, she will have her head shaved and suff sufficiently if um, on the other on the flip side of that, I don't even know why I said sufficiently. Um, <laughs> on the other side of that, if Victoria loses, obviously she will have her head shaved uh, as well. And um, yeah, not very many hair versus hair matches that I can think of that were significant. But uh, yeah, certainly one was Edge versus Kurt Angle. Obviously, Kurt Angle rocked the boldness. Um, but uh, yeah, Molly Holly would be defeated by a backslide pin from Victoria after a short but hard hitting match uh, that was decent for what they had to work with and uh, did feel a bit for these two because they are ultimately very, very good at what they do in a time where being good as a woman in wrestling was not necessarily seen as a good thing and it proves and it shows with this match because they didn't have a lot of time to work with what they did is set up a match that had a stipulation and got people interested and uh, yeah it was it was good it was a definitely a middle uh, of the Middle of the scoring sheet uh, for this one. But yes, a backslide from Victoria as she reverses uh, what looked like uh, Molly was either going for a, uh, a submission or a dominator or some kind of gory bomb or something like that. And uh, she loses and subsequently loses her hair as well. Um, so I'm going to give this one. 2.5 cheap shots out of 5. I think the stipulation added a lot to this. There's a lot of, uh, you know, fighting out of things. Gave you that little bit at the end where the uh, loser tries to run off, tries to um, shave the other person's head. Uh, the winner, in this case, in uh, in Victoria, Molly Holly, was not having any of it. And, uh, yes, I've never seen a barber chair with straps for the wrists and the waist but hey that must be something that's in the wwe's um <laughs> in the wwe's warehouse somewhere incidentally i would love to go into that place because it looks really cool i've seen videos looks looks fantastic we'll move quickly on to the next match which is for the wwe championship and the reason i'm going to do that is because Molly Holly is still getting her head shaved when Kurt Angle makes his entrance, which I always found absolutely hilarious. I thought they were going to sort of move to the back and, and have it shaved properly. But no, she carried on. And she was going for about five minutes trying to shave Molly Holly's head. And it was great. Um, absolutely surreal, Kurt Angle coming out. Oh, yeah, I'm a really serious wrestler but the this woman's shaving this other woman's head with some clippers and a barber chair with wrist restraints <laughs> oh dear right brilliant anyway <clears throat> so ultimately this match uh kurt angle versus eddie guerrero who uh was re uh was defending his championship won from brock lesnar of course uh kurt angle getting the um championship shot by winning a royal rumble i believe on smackdown so uh yeah it was it was cool um so yeah this match absolutely fantastic when you've got two two guys like this two veterans like this who can put everything into a match you know you're going to come out and it's going to be fun it's going to be technical because Eddie Guerrero could, you know, he could wrestle. He, he, he wasn't just like high flying and, and a luchador. He could actually do some really cool stuff. The lasso from El Paso finishing move, the submission move that Eddie Guerrero uses, absolutely bloody fantastic. And of course, Kurt Angle is well known as the two time Olympic gold medalists. Um, it, <laughs> 
uh, and also very, very good. But, you know, Kurt works the ankle um, quite a lot here. We know that he's uh, going for the ankle lock at some point. And uh, Eddie does fight quite well, quite a lot of the time. Um, ultimately, Kurt Angle will smell the blood in the water. And this is how the match finished. After a back and forth contest, uh, slow start, working up to a crescendo, Kurt Angle would smell that blood in the water, go for the ankle lock again. But from the previous ankle lock, Eddie Guerrero had loosened, loosened off his boot laces to get some air, get some um uh, get some um loose <laughs> looseness to his ankle and uh, yeah when Kurt Angle went in for that uh, ankle lock Eddie Guerrero would slip out of his boot as Kurt Angle was wondering what the heck was going off as he had Eddie's boot in his hand Eddie Guerrero would roll him up get the one two three with the help of the ropes and would be uh, uh, retaining his championship dubious positioning of course by the referee but hey like cheat and steal it says so in the song and once you hear that song you know who's coming you know exactly what he's going to do he's going to lie he's going to cheat and he's going to steal his way through to victory i'm going to give this one four cheap shots out of five absolutely brilliant and worthy of uh, wrestlemania main event status didn't get it there was another match of course that would go on after this but uh, yeah really 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 good match um both these guys hell of entertainers hell of a match whenever they got into the ring they had really good chemistry and very very good i can't say that enough it's absolutely fantastic Two more matches on the card for WrestleMania 20 as we go to the spectacle match, which is not people wearing spectacles, of course, or forcing other people to wear spectacles, but the one where the dead man returns after being buried alive at Survivor Series 2003 by the hands of his own brother and Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Kane arrives at the ring. The spectacle is there as he wicks his way to the ring. The buildings are on fire in the background and he's waiting. Undertaker's not coming. Undertaker's not coming. He's dead. I buried him. I, I killed him. He's, he's dead. And then the gong hits just after the... Oh, yes! And we know the Undertaker is back but not back in the normal sense of back but back as the original undertaker with paul bearer who incidentally is a real life undertaker um which is i always found absolutely bonkers when i found that but um yes this match is definitely more a spectacle than a, a wrestling match undertaker doesn't look like he's Mr. B. Obviously, he's been out for a couple of months, um, but doesn't look like he's Mr. B. He starts off really hot and heavy, laying into his brother with the fists. One of the best strikers in the business uh, is The Undertaker, and he throws those fists like nobody else does. And he eventually gets the victory over Kane. Kane doesn't put in much offense here. It's just a way to get the Undertaker back relevant again. As he, I mean, he was never not relevant, of course, but more relevant than uh, than he was uh, because he come back. Cave and Kane says, "You betrayed yourself by becoming a human being." Uh, I mean, it's great promo that, uh, but yeah, that's that was the promo. It was the eulogy of the Undertaker. Uh, Undertaker would ultimately get the victory 
with a hellacious tombstone pile driver on his brother. Uh, like I say, the spectacle in this one was bigger uh, than the actual match. That being said, said it was still really entertaining uh, and showed the level of what is to come, although it was not definitely not on par with the level that was uh, on the way. Uh, but at this point, it was like, what, 14 and 0, something like that. Uh, and then it became big. You know, this, this is the first time really that the streak had been mentioned. Um, and then obviously that would become a big thing later down the line when he'd go against Shawn Michaels and Triple H. I'm going to beat the streak. And that's what it became about. That was one of the biggest parts of WrestleMania. And sadly, that is no more because the man has actually officially retired, turned up in Saudi Arabia to present the winners of the he Saudi Arabia Cup or whatever it is for the Saudi Arabian Football League. Yes, that is the undertaker. Anyway, like I said, the spectacle was bigger than the actual match uh, and uh, proved to be so. So I'm going to give this one 2.5 cheap shots out of five. Some people may think that is harsh. However, there was definitely much better matches on this card. Uh, it was short. It was to the point. It did what it needed to do, and it was there to tell a story. And I do love a good story in wrestling. People know that if you've been listening to the podcast. But, yeah, it was middle of the road for this one. Moving on to the main event match now for the World Heavyweight Championship that is contested on the Raw brand only and was bought in because Brock Lesnar signed exclusively to SmackDown for the WWE Championship. It is Triple H defending his championship against his old rival, his ex-friend, Shawn Michaels, the Heartbreak Kid, and Chris Benoit. Ultimately, this WrestleMania would become known as the WrestleMania where the World Heavyweight Championship disappeared from existence until Randy Orton found it at SummerSlam. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, looking back at it, and I, I will keep saying this, as a wrestler, Chris Benoit was awesome. As a human being, probably not so much, but that could come down to a lot of factors and uh, yeah let's look at this from a, a perspective of, of watching wrestling and, and being a wrestling fan so this match becomes more about uh, Triple H and Shawn Michaels than it does about Benoit they're sort of dismissing him as being the third wheel even though Chris Benoit won the Royal Rumble to get the match in the first place. Shawn Michaels signed the contract, but, of course, Benoit still had a title match, so it became a triple threat match. One of the best triple threat matches I've ever seen. It had everything. Obviously, there's no disqualifications in a triple threat match, so they used everything at their disposal that they possibly could. People went into step. People went into barricades. There was tables being used. Um, there was um, blood in this one. And you know you're going to get that with Triple H and Shawn Michaels anyway. Uh, but it did become a bit awkward <laughs> with that. So, um, yeah, they, I mean, even Triple H and Shawn Michaels worked together to try and get Benoit out of the picture. They know he's a threat to... Either of them either retaining the championship or gaining the championship and ending their feud. But it is Chris Benoit that wins the match through using his patented submission move, the Crippler Crossface, on Triple H. Triple H nearly gets to the ropes and it's a battle uh, as uh, Shawn Michaels has been taken out on the outside. Chris Benoit rolls through. Brings Triple H back to the middle of the ring. He's got no chance of getting out of the triple cross space and ultimately taps out. <clears throat> this was a great match. 
And like I say, looking at it from the point of view of a wrestling fan, Chris Benoit ultimately very much deserved this push. I'm going to give this match 4.5 cheap shots out of 5. One of the best WrestleMania main events in recent times that I can remember. And it really does deserve all the plaudits for all three of these guys. Saul Michaels obviously coming back after having a broken neck. Triple H um, just for being really consistent. He'd come back from a, a quad uh, being torn. Um, you know, it's crazy that these guys can come back so quickly and do the stuff that they do. But, excuse me. It's great. It's such a good match. And WrestleMania 20, um, not the start of, of a really good series of WrestleManias, but really the start of the bigger WrestleManias. Uh, the ones where they get bigger venues, the ones where they try and fill football stadiums rather than hockey stadiums. So, yeah, that is, oh, excuse me, that is WrestleMania 20, or oh, 20, rather. <laughs> you get that dub to twang. Uh, that is WrestleMania 20, uh, one of my favourite WrestleManias of all time. I've got it on DVD, on three-disc box set, and uh, I would, I've also got WrestleMania 21 and WrestleMania 22. Ultimately, I did watch this on the network because it was a bit more convenient than chaining discs but I do have them and I still have them considering that they're going to no longer be produced and uh, I'm definitely going to be keeping them now we move on in, 20, in 2004 to Backlash uh, coming in April and uh, yeah if you've enjoyed the podcast let me know if you have any thoughts on WrestleMania 20, please leave them in the comment sections of the various places where I'm going to post this on Spotify, on YouTube. And we'll just say thank you very much for listening. I've been Luke. You have been Cheap Shot Nation. And this has been WrestleMania 20. 20 years ago today, the World Heavyweight Championship disappeared and was found again at SummerSlam. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> Goodbye.